Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, the organisers of the conference for inviting me. Uh, I'd also like to thank them for inviting me the, five years ago when the, when the uh, centre here was open. And that was a very memorable visit and I'm very happy to be back here again. Thank you very much. As you see from this opening slide, I'm called by my little name, which is Hugh. I'm not called David. So uh, please call me Hugh. Uh, the topic I'm addressing is uh, how do we do research on Asia in our institute? In order to uh, provide an answer to that, I think I have to give a, a bit broader perspective um, about New Zealand and Asia. So I call my talk Asia in New Zealand and New Zealand in Asia. I think uh, if we go back 50 years ago, it's safe to say that New Zealand uh, was sleeping on the edges of Asia, uh, unconcerned with Asia, in fact, actively wanting not to engage with Asia. Uh, a British High Commissioner to New Zealand referred to it as a sleeping princess vis-a-vis uh, -vis Asia in the 1950s. Uh, and, uh, New Zealand didn't want to associate itself with Australia, which was very concerned with its uh, northern borders. New Zealand still wanted to maintain its links with the old country, uh, and so it was, even though we had regional security agreements and so on, and sent troops to Malaya in the 1960s. I think uh, perceptions began to change uh, with the Colombo Plan, New Zealand was uh, one of the countries which implemented the Colombo Plan and brought uh, students, particularly from Southeast Asia, uh, to New Zealand and uh, exposed New Zealanders to um, people particularly from Malaysia, um, but other Southeast Asian countries. And that was a mutual learning experience. Those people went back to Southeast Asia and became leaders over time, and that's helped to create um, favorable links with Southeast Asia. Still, I think you could say New Zealand was sleeping right through until the 1980s. The rise of Japan and the rise of New Zealand trade with Japan obviously uh, started to change people's perceptions. New Zealand got uh, a new neoliberal government in the 1980s, which deregulated the economy, deregulated trade, and also changed the immigration law. So after 1987, New Zealand's borders were opened a lot wider, and um, a lot of Asian immigrants moved to New Zealand, and it fundamentally changed New Zealand's engagement with Asia. You'll see from this statistic, in 2001, 6.6% of New Zealand's population was Asian. That had almost doubled by 2013. Maori percentage of the population, that's indigenous people to New Zealand, was 14, 15%, and Pacific was 7.4%. So, when you talk about Asia Pacific to New Zealand, that means a certain thing. Pacific means in New Zealand, Maori and Pacific, Pacific people from the islands. Auckland is the biggest Polynesian city in the world. So um, our view of the Pacific is also covered by that. If you look at the average age of these different populations, you'll see the average age of the Asian population in New Zealand, according to the last census, was 31. Maori and Pacific, even younger. If you look at the white population, it's 41. 41 year olds typically not going to have many children. Asians are having more children. Maori and Pacific are having more children. So the ethnic composition of New Zealand's population is changing very rapidly. And it's even more noticeable if you look at Auckland. One third of New Zealand's population lives in Auckland. The city has a population of about 1.5 million. And at the last 
census, 21.7% of the population was classified as ethnically Asian. That's come out of almost nowhere in a period of 20 years Almost a quarter of the population of New Zealand's largest city is now Asian. Another quarter of the population is Maori and Pacific. It's estimated by 2025 that 30% of Auckland's population will be Asian. White people will very soon be in the minority in Auckland. So that is a huge change of the ethnic and cultural characteristics of New Zealand. And we feel it particularly within the University of Auckland, where, as you see at the bottom of the page there, over a third of our students are ethnically Asian. So we're preparing for a future where most of our students are Asian or, or Pacific, Polynesian, uh, and the minority of white people. There is a, a sizable Korean population uh, in Auckland. It's the third biggest uh, Asian ethnic population after Chinese and Indians. New, New Zealand's economic engagement with Asia is also changing very rapidly. There you have at the bottom some statistics on our biggest trading partners in 2001 versus 2013. In 2001, Australia, United States, Japan, United Kingdom were the, the biggest trading partners. Slowly, Asian countries have gone up, and now, in 2014, New Zealand's biggest trading partner is China. It's no longer Australia. So, our trading relations with Asia, been a lot of free trade agreements signed uh, with ASEAN, with China, under negotiation with Korea, with India. Um, trade, particularly in commodities, has boomed. But despite the huge influx of Asian people into New Zealand, despite our increasing trade with Asia, we're not quite a sleeping princess, perhaps. But you would be probably surprised that interest in Asia is not higher. And this is my personal view, uh, and I wasn't living in New Zealand in the 1980s when Japan was on the rise. People were very interested in Asia. And then I think they became tired. Perhaps the Asian financial crisis led people to believe, well, Asian model, Japanese model, things Asian, they all have to adapt to American, European, Western ways of doing things, so maybe we don't need to learn about Asia. Anyway, Asia is coming to New Zealand, so um, we don't need to adapt. So I think there's a certain complacency despite those figures I've shown you and despite the increasing trade. I think the discourse on New Zealand's engagement with Asia is primarily economic, revolves around uh, free trade agreements, and there's not a huge appetite for learning deeper things about history and culture and so on. So it's in that context that uh, the New Zealand Asia Institute operates. Very quickly, we've had um, at the University of Auckland. We've had Asian studies since 1965. Uh, we have majors now in Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and Asian studies. Um, we, we had a center for Asian studies since 1984. Now, center is not the same as school. The center is kind of a cross-faculty thing which was meant to not, not it didn't start out as a research institute. It started out to actually funnel interest in Asia into the university to focus the university more on how to engage with Asia and also to coordinate expertise across faculties. That's what our Asia Institute grew out of. So the New Zealand Asia Institute is a, a university level institute now hosted by the business school um, and because of that background, I would say if I looked at our research programs, we have two broad thrusts. 
One is the kind of research that's always been done in the Asia Institute, and it was a constant, sorry, a conscious decision made that the research in the Asia Institute, before it moved to the business school, would focus on not individual countries, but cross on issues which crossed several countries in Asia. So for instance, maritime security in East Asia, or economic development and cooperation in the Mekong Delta. And we typically got funding from the Japan Foundation, or Korea Foundation, or Jiang Ji Kuo, uh, and hosted international conferences, sometimes in New Zealand, sometimes in Asian countries. So there's a kind of a history of that type of research, and since the institute moved to the host business school, there's also been um, a focus on New Zealand's economic engagement with Asia. And there is a kind of, I suppose, a tension between those two, kind of focusing on Asia and uh, uh, cross-national, transnational issues within Asia and a more economically um, New Zealand interest informed uh, kind of engagement uh, research, how are New Zealand businesses engaging with Asia in the, in the light of all these free trade agreements that were signed. Uh, and New Zealand is primarily a country of small businesses, apart from a few giants like uh, Fonterra. So um, you can say New Zealand has had a free trade agreement with China. Our trade, uh, sorry, for, since 2009, 2008. In the five years since, trade has tripled with China. But if you look at the type of trade, it's uh, from New Zealand. And a lot of commodities going, uh, but sophisticated manufacturers are not necessarily increasing. So there are, there are kind of a lot of issues, particularly about small businesses engaging with Asia that our institute is expected to do research on. There is a kind of attention. I think the tension was brought out for, in uh, Professor Dwyer's uh, presentation this morning about a, a more humanistic type of research and a more uh, instrumental kind of research. And as the director of the institute, I feel I'm supposed to accommodate those two kind of things and I feel the tensions within myself. So I'm pleased to hear them both expressed at this uh, conference. And once again, I thank the organizers of the conference.